So uh, Ahmed studied medicine at Cambridge and then uh, St. George's Hospital Medical School, qualifying in 1994. After he obtained his MRCP in 1998, uh, he took a very um, insightful decision to do his doctoral research under Professor Alan Thompson at the Institute of Neurology and completed his PhD in 2005. He was awarded a very prestigious FCC lectureship in 2009 um, and at this time, he was also appointed as consultant neurologist at Queen's Square and consultant uh, neurologist specialising in neuro-ophthalmology at Moorfields. Uh, his research utilises advanced imaging tools to help understand mechanisms of damage and recovery uh, in neurological disease with a focus on demyelinating disorders and in particular optic neuritis. He's obtained over four million pounds of research funding, including a recent major project award by the MRC to extend his longitudinal investigations into demyelinating clinically isolated syndromes. He's published in a range of uh, impressive journals, including Braid, Annals of Neurology, Lancet Neurology and JAMA. Um, and he was, of course, elect uh, awarded his chair last year. Um, it's a great pleasure now to um, introduce Ahmed to give his uh, inaugural lecture. So over to you. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll just try and share my screen to begin. Um, yeah. We and thank you. You got it. Yeah. And, yep. and Perfect. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jenny, for a great, great talk. I thought it was really, really um, brilliant talk that, that you delivered. So, uh, I'm going to um, divide this talk into several sections. The first section will be to outline uh, sort of major influences in my life of people who I, who I remember have supported me uh, in my early life in particular as a junior doctor. And um, uh, I just wish to repay their kindness in, in some way during this talk. And then I'll talk a bit about me and what I used to get up to at school, but hopefully won't disclose too much about myself. Um, and then in the last part of the talk, uh, which I think should take about 30, 35 minutes, I'm just going to outline some of the major research themes um, that, that, that I pursued in my uh, research career over the last uh, two decades. So I just want to start with, the, well, I'll go back to uh, my early childhood. I went to school in the 1980s um, and uh, secondary school in the 1980s. Um, and there I met uh, this gentleman, Keith Smith. He was a history uh, teacher and a fencing master head of CCF. And I got to know him um, very well, uh, actually. He was a great personality, very witty uh, raconteur. Um, and he was uh, very supportive of me through my career. And I'm very, you know, very happy that I stayed in contact with him after I left school. Um, unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year, and his memorial service actually clashes uh, with this uh, lecture, but I, I still remember him with great uh, fondness. And the other people I want to acknowledge and recognize um, are uh, Dr. Peter King and uh, Stuart Elford. They were my uh, biology A-level uh, teachers. They, they were great teachers who taught with great energy and passion, um, and uh, they made choosing the biological science is a very easy um, career option for me. I'm delighted that um, Dr. King is um, here uh, listening in on me uh, giving this uh, inaugural uh, lecture. Um, unfortunately, Stuart Elford passed away again earlier this year, but um, I still remember him with um, affection. Then uh, after my medical training, I did some SHO posts uh, in London on my first SHO senior health officer post was at the Middle Hoss, Middlesex Hospital uh, where I uh, did cardiology and I was fortunate enough to uh, work for this uh, uh, cardiologist, uh, Dr. Howard Swanton. Um, and Howard, uh, his, his daughter actually works with us here at the MS unit and his son, I believe, is a clinical academic in oncology at UCLH as well. Um, Howard was a brilliant uh, clinician with very striking uh, clinical um, acumen, but he also had this great rapport uh, with patients and was able to interact with them in a genuine and uh, caring manner, something I've never forgotten. 
and something that I, I, I try to emulate um, when I see patients, but um, not as successfully as, as he did. Um, and I, I wish him well. I understand that he's enjoying his uh, retirement in uh, Dorset. Then a bit later on, I uh, did a post here at uh, Queen Square, uh, where I worked for uh, Dr. Morgan Hughes, Gordon Plant, and uh, Charles Clark. Um, and they, they had a strong influence in me, uh, seriously considering neurology as a, as a career. They were uh, brilliant clinicians, very knowledgeable, and uh, uh, taught with great uh, enthusiasm and um, energy. And uh, I'm lucky that I stayed in touch uh, with Gordon and um, Charles uh, after my um, SHO uh, post was over. And I'm particularly grateful for Charles uh, for uh, attending this lecture and watching me um, uh, deliver it. And I wish him well too. And then um, after that, I, I was a research fellow uh, here. I undertook my doctoral uh, training uh, as a PhD, for a PhD under um, uh, Alan Thompson. And he was and still is a great mentor to me. He was, everyone knows what a tremendous impact he's had in uh, MS research and continues to have um, in research and clinical care. And he really um, sort of helped uh, mold the way that I think about performing research um, and it actually encouraged me to pursue research after my PhD uh, uh, had completed. Um, so I'm grateful to that. Uh, and then lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, this gentleman, Ian Donald, and I'm sure everyone knows he was a pioneer of MS research and I met him um, multiple times during my uh, research fellowship here at the um, NMR unit. Um, Ian uh, was very kind, he was, had great enthusiasm and energy, which I, reminded me actually a bit of um, Dr. Morgan Hughes, for those who uh, remember. Um, uh, he was very supportive of me and took a genuine interest in the research that I was um, undertaking. Um, um, I'm very pleased to have uh, known him. So uh, that's a little bit about the, the people who have shaped my career. I just want to, I'll just spend a few slides talking about uh, myself, what I used to sort of get up to. Um, so uh, I was born in Pakistan. Um, my parents came, uh, emigrate, immigrated here when I was one year old. Uh, and their ancestors were from um, Iran or Persia. I went to school primary and secondary school in Surrey. Um, my secondary school was uh, called Whitgift, which um, looking back was, I had great memories of where um, it, it had fantastic facilities, resources, and provided lots of good opportunities for its people. It's now a, a very sports-centric school and um, concentrates a lot on co-curricular activities and regularly produces uh, professional sports people. Um, when I was there, it was, wasn't so sporty, but it was quite good at fencing, which is the sport that um, I did. I managed to dig out, dig out a few uh, photographs of myself um, in this sport. Here's, here's one of me in um, some competition facing an opponent. Uh, I'll let the audience decide which uh, one of these two I am. Uh, please email me with your, with your ideas. Um, then here's one of me receiving a... Uh, some sort of award after competition. In the background, you can spot the young looking uh, Keith Smith, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. There's one of our fencing team. Um, this guy must have been about 13 or 14 when this photograph was taken. That's me in the top left. That's my uh, brother, who was also in the team, who's a uh, year younger uh, to me. And for, for the keen eyed amongst you, this was our fencing captain. That's Tim Davy, who is the currently the, the director general of the BBC. He is also an avid fencer. Um, uh, before we move on to uh, the research themes I want to talk about, I just thought we'd take a trip down memory lane. I had many happy times in um, uh, working uh, with my colleagues, uh, making long lasting friendships in the NMR research unit and managed to compose a, bit, a collage of photographs with the help uh, mainly of David McManus, um, thank you for these photographs, and also Olga uh, Ciccarelli. 
and um, uh, I won't embarrass uh, everyone, but just maybe highlight a few people. This is Declan and Olga, who don't seem to have aged over the decades. Uh, this is Peter Brex, who's uh, uh, consultant at King's College now. There's some physicists in the past uh, um, who have moved on to other places. Chris Clark, Jeff Parker, uh, Gareth Parker, who is my PhD, and my uh, secondary PhD supervisor. Uh, Padia uh, wheeler Kingshot, who's still here with us. And then a youthful looking Alan and uh, David Miller. And then a collection of other uh, research fellows who were my colleagues around that time. So now the, the third part of the talk, um, I just want to spend talking about my, uh, some of my research uh, careers. Uh, I'll focus on um, this sort of theme that has dominated part of my career, which is uh, using advanced imaging tools, uh, especially MRI and OCT, to try and understand uh, mechanisms of demyelination in particular, and other CNS pathology, but I'm going to concentrate on demyelination. When I started as a, a PhD student, I, I worked on optic uritis, and this has been a recurring theme of the last two decades for me. This is a condition that I'm sure everyone knows is very closely linked to multiple uh, sclerosis, which is an autoimmune uh, condition uh, which attacks uh, the, the central nervous system. Optic neuritis uh, affects uh, the optic nerves uh, behind the eye. And for those who are slightly unfamiliar with anatomy, I'll just briefly go through the neuroanatomy of the uh, visual system, which will help us um, a bit later. So the optic nerves project back from the globes and they sort of meet in the, this area called the optic chiasm, and where half of the nerve fibers cross over and then the projections continue where they sign out in the lateral geniculate bodies and then second order projections um, go in the optic uh, radiations along in the white posterior part of the visual system uh, and the white matter tracks uh, to meet the visual uh, cortical areas, uh, primary visual cortex where visual processing occurs and then further visual processing occurs um, along the, the back of the brain or the top of the brain in the dorsal processing stream and then the underside of the brain in the ventral uh, processing stream. People with optic neurosis can get blurred vision and loss of color vision and pain when they look around. And if you look in the back of the eyes, you can see sometimes evidence for swelling of the optic nerve. It's considered, it was traditionally considered a fairly straightforward model to study damage, uh, mechanisms of damage and recovery, especially related to EMS, multiple sclerosis, plaque, or lesion. Um, so we proposed this model with, uh, a few years ago to highlight the fact that perhaps it's not as simple as you first thought and there, there are multiple components involved. So at the site of the lesion, there are the processes of inflammation, edema, demyelination that cause damage to the nerve and result in visual loss. And then um, these, uh, the inflammation and edema result, uh, leading to some visual recovery, but there may be a residual scarring of the nerve, which uh, may result in shrinkage or atrophy of the nerve, which we can quantify using different imaging techniques, including uh, OCT or optical coherence uh, tomography. There may also be some remyelinating effects, which we can uh, try to visualize uh, with specific uh, MRI sequences. Uh, and there's uh, perhaps a putative uh, contribution uh, from cortical neuroplasticity towards visual recovery, which I uh, will explain uh, shortly. Um, and then there may be downstream effects uh, of the initial insult in the optic radiation, perhaps the occipital uh, cortical uh, regions. So I'm, I'm just going to highlight, so we've done, we've done studies looking at each of these components. I'll just highlight one or two studies from, for, for each uh, of these factors in turn. So if we start with the uh, site of the lesion, um, I'll uh, just share this study that, in which we looked at effects of inflammation um, over time after acute optic neuritis. Um, this was led by Simon Hickman, who was my colleague um, during my uh, PhD. Uh, we found there was a large variation in the duration of inflammation in the optic nerve after the insult, which was, which was unrelated to uh, 
uh, visual recovery. But when we looked at the, the length of the uh, inflammatory lesion, we found that shorter lesions tended to predict uh, better visual recovery at uh, one year, providing some clinical significance to, uh, to this technique. We also looked um, using a specific MRI uh, sequence at myelination and remyelination effects. This was uh, using MTR, magnetization transfer imaging. And this provides us a, a sort of index of uh, a mixture of myelination and tissue uh, integrity. Uh, so we developed a sequence in our lab and found that it correlated quite well with um, uh, electrophysiological measures of uh, demyelination. And we found uh, in the, the nerves affected by optic neuritis, there was a sort of a quadratic profile of change over time where there were initial decreases uh, to a minimum uh, and then some evidence for increase over time, perhaps suggestive of remyelination um, effects. If you move on now to uh, neuroplasticity changes, uh, there was a lot of interest um, in, in this. And the uh, um, early studies were done by um, David Waring and Ed Fulmore in particular, where they used this technique of uh, functional MRI, which is able to um, evaluate brain activation patterns in response to certain visual uh, stimuli. And they taught me how to do functional MRI when I was a, a student here at an MR research uh, unit. And in this early study, uh, we found that uh, uh, altered changes in the cortical activation pattern in uh, patients affected by optic neuritis when we stimulated their affected eye. But in these patients, they made visual recoveries back to normal. And they had no evidence of multiple sclerosis, no brain lesions. They were essentially isolated of multiple sclerosis patients, which is very interesting, but it was, it was unclear whether these changes contributed to the vision, whether they were just reacted to the insult affecting the optic nerve. Um, so we did a follow-up study to look at this in more detail. And in the study, we were able to co-model together uh, appropriate structural factors that uh, were related to damage to the optic nerve and the functional response uh, to a stimulation paradigm to help explain um, visual function. And we found that the functional response was still able to explain visual function after removing the effects of structural factors. Uh, and these effects were found in specific areas of the brain called the lateral occipital uh, cortical areas along the ventral visual streams, which I highlighted um, earlier, which are strongly suggestive of some form of compensatory uh, reorganization after optic neuritis. And a follow-up, uh, study on an independent uh, cohort of patients, uh, Tom Jenkins looked at, um, focused in on these areas in the lateral occipital regions, and he found that uh, activation of baseline in these areas was able to predict a uh, visual outcome uh, at uh, one year after optic neuritis, again providing further support of uh, some form of compensatory neuroplasticity um, after optic neuritis. And in parallel uh, with uh, these studies, we, did a, we performed another longitudinal study where we looked um, at this condition, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. neuropathy. Uh, in this condition, um, the front part of the optic nerve is effectively killed off by a blockage in the blood vessel. And patients, unfortunately, with this condition don't make good recovery, they make poor or non-recovery. So this um, disease model we used as a qualitative comparator uh, with the optic neuritis model, which we used uh, to, to, to evaluate recovery. And when we, when we performed longitudinal functionality in this study, we found extensive cortical reorganization changes in the brain, which changed over time, especially in the frontal areas, which we interpreted as being non compensatory in nature because of a lack of visual recovery. But neuroplasticity, uh, we thought, could take a mixture of different forms, compensatory, non-compensatory, depending either on the timing of the interrogation or the type of uh, pathology. And then finally, if you look further downstream in the, um, the posterior visual pathways, 
several cross-sectional studies have um, evaluated this and found evidence for changes in the optic radiation, which are the downstream projections from the optic nerve um, across the synapses in the natural geniculate body, body, bodies. Um, but ideally, what we want to do is to um, evaluate this longitudinally to see if these changes appear over time after um, optic neuritis insult. And this is what we were able to do um, uh, in a longitudinal study where we've looked in, in detail at the optic radiations using a specific MRI technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which gave us information about water diffusion and provided us with uh, microstructural uh, organizational characteristics um, of, of the white matter traps uh, in the optic radiations. And we found changes uh, consistent with uh, degeneration that evolved over time after optic neuritis and occurred over the course of a year. In addition to that, um, we looked at markers of damage to the optic nerve, optic nerve actually at three months, so a marker of damage to the anterior visual pathways. And we found that this was able to predict um, these markers of degeneration in the optic radiations at one year. So a marker of damage to the anterior visual pathway could predict uh, damage in the posterior visual pathways with a lag interval. So taking everything together, this provided strong longitudinal evidence for antral grade degeneration after um, optic neuritis. I, go on, I just I want to acknowledge Carmen Tour and Olivia Goodkin, who did um, uh, most of the work for this uh, study, for which I'm grateful. And then finally, um, if we just think about the last component in this in this um, model, changes in the occipital uh, cortex. Um, several studies have found changes in the occipital um, cortex after optic neuritis, but um, when, when Tom Jenkins investigated this, he found that um, the thickness levels in the, the so-called pericalcarine areas or visual cortical areas, they were able to predict conversion to multiple sclerosis by 12 months. And this association was not present when you looked at other cortical regions, which served as, a, as, as an internal control. So it appears that the occipital cortex may be particularly sensitive to neurodegenerative effects in patients or at risk of multiple sclerosis. As well as looking at pathophysiological mechanisms of optic nitrates, we have been involved in uh, treatment trials. This was a landmark study by Raj Kapoor and Rian Raptopilov, that uh, conducted at two centres in London and Sheffield, where Farman Hickman and helped recruit patients from um, Sheffield. And I, um, this looked at phenytoin and the effects of phenytoin in trying to protect the, the optic nerve from sort of long-standing damage after optic neuritis. Um, and it was landmark because it found a, a beneficial effect of phenytoin in um, helping to save optic nerve fibers, which we measured uh, using OCT, optical coherence uh, tomography. In parallel with the study, we conducted uh, a specific MRI study of the optic nerves um, in the London cohort of patients where we looked at the uh, MTR changes and the area changes. Uh, and we found significant beneficial effects, again, phenytoin over placebo in certain parts of the uh, optic nerve, which um, supported the primary uh, analysis. And I'd like to acknowledge that the uh, Marcello, Vicente, Marius, and uh, Alessio were um, instrumental in uh, this analysis. So I hope I've um, convinced people that perhaps this optic neuritis model is slightly more complicated than we first thought or realized that pathophysiology is complex, it's multifactorial. Nevertheless, uh, we, we still think that most recovery mechanisms are um, determined by structural factors at the site of the lesion. There are still some neuroplastic contributions to visual recovery. We still need to work out how all these different factors are interrelated. And we have new MRI techniques available um, that can probe microstructural and myelination characteristics of the optic nerve. And this is particularly timely with the increasing interest in remyelinating and neuroprotective um, studies on the horizon. So with this in mind, um, 
we've appointed a fellow, Sri Kadali, by uh, the Cleveland Clinic Fellowship, who's going to undertake um, this project with Marios Inakis and Becky Sampson, which should provide some very um, exciting results. Um, so the next part, I think we, we, I'll talk about the relationship between optic neuritis and clinical isolators. You know, it's a short step to, because optic neuritis can be studied from two perspectives or different perspectives. One is as a lesion model. And the other is uh, because it uh, can herald the onset of the development of multiple sclerosis and can signify the, the so-called clinically isolated syndrome. Um, in which a, a fairly large proportion of people can go on to convert to multiple sclerosis. Um, so we, we've been recruiting um, patients with clinically isolated syndrome with optic neuritis and also uh, non-optic neuritis presentations using advanced imaging to try and understand uh, why it is that some people convert and try and understand the mechanisms early on that help predict um, disease progression uh, and clinical disability. And uh, this recent paper um, highlights one of the uh, preliminary results uh, of the baseline, uh, some of the baseline cohort. This was done by Sara Polarone, um, who was a recent PhD student here, who was helped uh, by Barbara Solenki, Indran Dadagnanum, Ferran Pados, and Francesco uh, Grusu. And uh, in this study, we looked at a sample of patients, a cohort of patients very early after CIS. And we used um, uh, essentially two MRI um, uh, techniques. One was called NODI, which is able to give a sort of advanced diffusion imaging technique, uh, giving us some microstructural information about um, the voxels. And the other was called sodium imaging, which gives us gives us metabolic information about uh, voxels. And the interesting thing in, from this study is that we found no differences between CIS and healthy controls in the, the more standard conventional uh, measures of brain volumes between the two groups of patients. But in spite of that, we still found um, alterations in the microstructure of the brains outside the lesions and the so-called normal appearing tissue in particular evidence of uh, increasing fiber disorganization. Moreover, when we examined uh, one of the major white matter pathways, the corpus callosum, which connects both hemispheres together, we found additional evidence for uh, reduced density of so-called neurites or nerve fibers, higher sodium indicating some metabolic um, alterations, and again, higher fiber disorganization. And this was associated with clinical disability or uh, in terms of walking speed. The neurite density within the corpus callosum was also uh, linked to the neurite density of white matter lesions outside the corpus callosum in distant parts of the brain. The best, ex the most reasonable explanation of this was on uh, neuro retrograde neurodegeneration effects early on from white matter lesions that are influencing corpus callosum, perhaps affecting uh, clinical disability. So this, uh, this study provides both cl clinical and pathological uh, correlations using advanced MRI uh, techniques. In the last part of the talk, I'm just going to focus on this, this area that we, of connectomics. This is, uh, and I'm, I'll present some studies that we've been doing looking at this area in CIS and MS. But in order to do that, I just wanted to spend a few slides explaining it in a bit more detail. Um, so um, this is still an evolving area, but it's thought to provide a very useful framework for us to, to try and help us uh, understand uh, brain networks in particular. And it's, uh, we realized that some time ago that we can represent brains as uh, networks of so-called nodes um, uh, connected by uh, interacting edges. Uh, and the so-called connectome is effectively a wiring diagram, which we can construct at different spatial scales, depending on the tools at our disposal. It can, it can be constructed at microscopic, mesoscopic, or macroscopic scale. In our uh, particular unit, we have, because we have neuroimaging data available, we can um, look at the macroscopic scale. How do you get from data to the actual graph? Well, this talk will be focused mainly on, only on structural connectivity, 
And the idea uh, essentially is to divide the brain into different areas, um, which we assign as nodes. And for each pair of nodes or areas, uh, we can work out a sort of strength of connection between them, depending on the type of MRI scan that uh, we're using to interrogate uh, the brain. And then from this, we can construct what's called an adjacency matrix, where the rows and the columns represent different brain areas. And each element of the matrix encodes the type and strength of connectivity that we're interested in. And we can derive brain graphs and perform uh, uh, mathematical uh, tricks based on graph theory to uh, undertake two classes of analysis. One is connectivity analysis, where we're looking at the, 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 stripe, the strength of connections, essentially, at either nodal level or global level. And the other is um, trying to understand uh, network topology, which describes the structural organizational characteristics of uh, these networks. So what are this? What is the topology of, of the brain in health? To answer this, I want to go back over 100 years to this gentleman, Santiago de Monica Howe, who was a famous uh, Spanish neuroscientist who won the Nobel Prize. And he developed these laws of conservation of time, space, and material to account for the morphological characteristics of neural structures. So if we try and deconstruct this and unpick what he meant. So by space and material, he's really referring to the, the, the pressure uh, to minimize metabolic resources. Uh, brains with larger amounts of wiring require more material, but also take up more metabolic resources. So there is a sort of evolutionary imperative to optimize or minimize this um, in theory. So if we think of if we think of how to construct um, a brain where we minimize the amount of material used, we, we would come up with a topology that is regular, in which the uh, each node is um, linked uh, to its nearest spatial neighbor. So the, uh, the path links between nodes are very small, uh, of small length. Um, so this tends to use up less material and conserves material. Um, however, if we think about network communication as well, which has obvious um, implications for organism survival, in order to communicate between the front and the back of the of this network, we need to cross over multiple paths. So the average so-called path length is relatively high and it's relatively time inefficient. So we can conserve material, but this is at the expense of time. And if you try and make think of a construct a network that is able to therefore conserve time and provide high network efficiency, you would come up with a network close to random topology where there are long range long range connections across different parts of the brain. This takes up more wiring cost. The wiring cost is not minimized and uses up more metabolic um, resources. So there's a sort of tension between uh, wiring cost and material and um, network efficiency and time. It turns out that in animal model studies and, and in vivo, uh, brains uh, adopt a sort of topology that's in between these two sort of compromises both. Um, and in particular, people may have heard of this small world um, topology that, that it, it exists in animals, where there are multiple short range connections, and then the proportion of which are sort of uh, strategically placed long range connections that can help to reduce uh, communication uh, time across different parts of the network. Any deviation from these, from this sort of small world topology towards either regular or random topology um, can result from network disruption and affect uh, clinical disability and be seen in different brain diseases. Um, so with th these concepts in mind, what happens to the connectivity metrics after optic neuritis? Well, we did this study with um, Kalman and Arman in particular, who looked at structural cortical network changes um, after uh, multiple after optic neuritis in particular and followed it up, followed them up over the year. And they found changes in these metrics, decreases actually over a year compared with healthy controls. In addition, they found that patients who converted to multiple sclerosis by a year showed greater reductions than the patients who stayed or, uh, or remained um, uh, CIS, i.e. who didn't convert to multiple sclerosis therefore providing a, a putative or potential marker to attract the conversion of, uh, 
patients to multiple sclerosis. Um, another study by um, Sarah Colleron um, extended this. Uh, it was a multiple, the multi-center study across uh, Europe uh, with the help of Ferran Prados, Paris Camden, uh, Frederick uh, Barkov, uh, co-supervisor. Uh, and she found, uh, performing structural connectivity analysis, she found that um, CI uh, clin clinically isolated syndrome patients deviated away from small world to regular topology. Uh, and this topology was associated with slower cognitive processing and also with higher number of white matter lesions. So that was uh, indicating very likely fewer long range connections and more dense local uh, connections. So again, some, uh, uh, a marker that it helps to explain clinical function and has a pathological uh, correlate. More recently, uh, work by Michael Foster, uh, our PhD, uh, current PhD fellows, have looked into this using diffusion-based connectivity in early CIS. And he has also found uh, relationships between disability and uh, with uh, lesion volumes, markers of connection pathology. This has also been uh, performed with the help of Ferran uh, Barris and Indran David uh, with Wallace and Claudio's support. Now, the, the tools that we use to investigate CIS, these sort of advanced methodology tools, we can also apply to multiple sclerosis, and we have done in a few um, studies which I want to highlight. And this was work done by Thalish, Chara Lambus, um, uh, Declan Char, Jonathan Clayton, and um, Claudia Wheeler King Shot. And he looked at a mixed cohort of patients with multiple sclerosis and applied diffusion connectivity analysis to them. And he found that um, these patients had net reduced network efficiency. Uh, but in addition to that, um, these patients also um, had uh, volumetric MRI performed, uh, which is a standard sort of uh, research tool that we use to try and help explain uh, clinical function and progression. Uh, when you try to formulate or uh, construct uh, statistical models to help explain the physical disability and cognitive, dis cognitive disability, we found that the network metrics explain these uh, clinical measures the best um, over and above the MRI metrics. And they provide some useful clinical correlate. Um, we, also, we also looked at this, this concept of the principal network um, in this same group of patients with multiple sclerosis where we're able to decompose these networks into sub-networks with strong internal connectivity. And when we looked at the first and second principal networks, we found specific hubs that were weaker or lost in certain phenotypes of multiple sclerosis. And uh, the strength of the hubs within these networks were also associated with um, physical and cognitive uh, clinical scores. So uh, to summarize, uh, I've talked about some influences in my life, um, the positive influences in my life. I've uh, revealed a bit about myself and the research themes um, that have sort of some of the research themes have dominated my research um, career and how we've used optic nitrous both as a uh, model to understand lesion formation and damage and uh, as a model to sort of help us uh, understand CIS, clinically isolated syndromes and, and disability progression uh, in MS. This is ongoing. Um, I have uh, a lot of people to acknowledge um, uh, from here and Moorfields um, High Hospital where I work. I'm particularly grateful to uh, uh, Alan Thompson, Olga, Chikarelli, Claudia Wheeler, Kingshot, Decton, and um, Chard, who've done lots of research collaborations together uh, with and who've been very supportive of my career. There are a lot of students who, who use research, who've done very good research, I've not been able to share, I'm really sorry, I apologize for that. People like Adnan, uh, Liz, and Marino, who've done really good work in um, functional MRI and uh, connectivity. And then Alessio Bianchi, Rosa Cortese, who has um, performed some really nice studies, optic nerve MTR, uh, recently in, in, in MOSD. And I'd like to thank the team at Moorfields and um, at Queen Square, um, as well and all the, in particular, the, uh, the administrators 
um, here at the NMI research unit uh, and at um, uh, the administrators of our MS team here at um, Queen Square and the nursing team to provide an excellent, uh, safe and robust uh, clinical service. I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors that have helped fund the research I've been involved in, especially the UK MS Society and the Medical Research Council, uh, and the Rose Trees Trust um, and Alan and Babette Sainsbury's charitable fund has been particularly uh, generous and supportive of us uh, recently, so I'm grateful um, to them as well. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my family. I have a picture of my parents on their wedding day, uh, my wife in the middle, and my three children as youngsters, and then uh, now growing up all too quickly into young adults. And I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ahmed, for a really nice, uh, clear lecture. So I'm pleased now to hand over to Professor Alan Thompson, Dean of the Faculty of Brain Sciences, for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Mike. I hope I'm uh, audible and visible. Um, yes, both. Great. <laughs> so again, as, as Louise said, on behalf of all of the attendees, um, really very, very many congratulations, Ahmed. It's a superb lecture. Um, Really, really wonderful. Um, I've been working with Ahmed now for um, probably over 20 years, and it's been a very enjoyable and, and, and interesting experience. I can still uh, remember the day Charles Clark called into my office and said he had um, uh, somebody working with him who was very, very bright, though quite quiet and a bit shy, but he felt confident that he'd be a great researcher. And... Um, and, and Charles was, was quite right. Um, Ahmed has a certain, certain characteristics which make him a really, really good uh, researcher. He's, his attention to detail is phenomenal. He's very careful, highly meticulous in his work. He checks and rechecks his results until he's completely satisfied as to their veracity. But once satisfied, he holds his view very strongly, and you have to have very strong evidence to encourage him uh, to reconsider. But he's incredibly thoughtful and inquiring, and he pursues his ideas in a, a logical and, and rational way. And he's self-deprecating almost to a fault. And I, I think all of these characteristics were evident in this evening's beautifully crafted lecture, which charted the many new insights Ahmed has provided in the very challenging area of neuroimaging, particularly in relation to optic neuritis. But his paper on cortical plasticity following acute optic neuritis was a landmark study, which really helped open up the field. And similarly, his work on brain connectivity and brain networks, which is continuing, uh, it was a very early contribution to what is now a, a thriving field. And all of these required really careful, detailed study. It is a very impressive body of work, and it's very gratifying and totally deserving that Ahmed is now a professor. Although I do remember that when I said I'd like to chat to him now that he'd become a professor, he suggested that it wasn't necessary because he didn't really believe it had actually happened. So I, I fully anticipate that this, uh, this will be the beginning of another phase of research activity. So Many, many congratulations, Ahmed, and all the very, very best for the future. And thank you again for a, a wonderful inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you, Ahmed, for a great lecture. Thanks to both lecturers and both colleagues who gave the vote of thanks. That was a great evening. Both were really stimulating lectures um, and uh, deserved of their, uh, of their chairs. So unfortunately, we can't take you for a drink now, but you can go and have a drink in your own home if you would like to. Uh, otherwise, I'll just wish you a very pleasant evening. And that's the end of uh, the proceedings for, for today. So thanks, everybody. And good night. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Bye.